Now, there are candidate predictive biomarkers like the omega-3 test. I want to very quickly uh, talk about that. Um, now, Michelle, when are we having lunch? Oh, okay, great. So we have about another half an hour before we're going to break for lunch, if that's okay with folks. Um, and what is the omega-3 test about? It's about the balance of omega-3s like EPA, DHA, and omega-6. And guess what? America is really rich in omega-6 and really poor in omega-3. So I often give more omega-3 as the supplement and little or no omega-6 as the supplement because I want to restore balance. And the literature here is very strong. Bill Harris, Artemis Simopoulos, the importance of the ratio of omega-6 to 3 fatty acids, uh, omega-3 index. And uh, Dr. Harris was in uh, collaborating with Pat Patty Doyster, a friend and colleague of mine, and he was lamenting the fact that it was so hard to find people who had healthy omega-3 indices. And she just pointed at me, he took out a lancet, took a little drop of blood, took it back to his lab, and I'm their poster child at the moment. 16%, they want more than 8%, and I'm sitting at 16%. Why? My blood pressure is better, my restorative sleep is better, my moods are better, my digestion's better. My experience of my life is that this is saving my life, and I want you to have the same experience. So if you want to enhance immune function and improve insulin sensitivity and reduce inflammation and repair deficit and improve brain function, because one third of the brain is DHA, and I know there are people who will say, well, just DHA or just EPA. I don't say that. I say EPA for body and brain, DHA for brain and body, you need both. And you need both for a very simple reason. Essential fats are very hard to change. Super healthy people can interconvert omega-3 and 6. They can take the GLA or ALA precursors and make them active. The very people who we see have desaturase problems. They're not able to convert. You have to give them the active omega-3 and usually hold back on the omega-6. For um, competitive mental performance or physical performance, I remember back in the day, Barry Sears used to talk about kind of DHA, EPA kind of ranges on the high end for that level of performance, um, whether it's you know, a corporate guy or an athlete. Um, whether it's for yourself or, or in general, what's your kind of range for EPA, DHA, or, you know, Total daily intake for people that work 70 hours a week. Sure. Yeah, and more cognitive. Well. Right. And so my recommendation is what I said before, which is you take enough EPA and DHA so that your omega-3 index is greater than 8%. And how much is that? As much as you need. Um, and, and more to the point, uh, Barry's a very capable communicator who takes complicated issues and oversimplifies them and sometimes trivialize them. And this is one where he trivializes. Because how much antioxidant do you have protecting your omega-3 and omega-6? You must, if you're not taking in sufficient antioxidants based on a C-cleanse, and you increase your unsaturated, polyunsaturated fat intake, you're going to oxidize and damage them. And if you put oxygen on a fat, it's like putting a hand grenade on a molecule. So I've had the chance to talk to Barry about this, and I think that he and I agree 100% on the data, and what he says is too complicated. And what I say is, live in harmony with your nature and in balance, and what that translates to is use these biomarkers and modify your intake based on the biomarkers, because some people will need much more and some people will need much less, and it's a function of uptake, assimilation, utilization, but also the collaterals, the antioxidants, the cell acidosis, the cofactors. And it's really amazing to me um, how often folks are able to get deeply into an issue. Like if you're a high performance person, you need this amount of DHA or EPA. And then you sit down with them and you say, well, what about the context? What about the, the way in which physiology functions. And they're smart, and they can understand, and all that is great, except 
they come back to six or 60 or 600. Uh, not so much about fats, but uh, as you may remember, Linus Pauling recommended nine grams of vitamin C, then he recommended 18 grams of vitamin C, but it was a fixed dose for everyone. And I got to ask him why, and he said, because doctors are so stupid that they can only remember a fixed number, like 200 for cholesterol <laughs> and, and 18 for ascorbic. What I'm saying to you is people can find out how much omega-3 and omega-6 they need, how much EPA and DHA they need. So if you can tell me the consumption rate, I can tell you the assimilation need. But you can't easily predict the consumption rate, because then you need to know antioxidant status, acidosis status, cofactor status. How efficient is the system? When the system is really efficient, when it has all of the stuff it needs and doesn't lack anything or uh, have a toxic burden, then the system is very efficient and you don't need much. On the other hand, let's say you're consuming a lot because of the stresses uh, of either your profession or your exercise program or, or you might need more or you might not. Do you know that we have some elite athletes that are vegetarians and some of them are really very articulate vegetarians? Now they may eat five to 6,000 calories a day when they're in training and they need that because they're burning off those calories. But you can be an elite athlete and still be a vegetarian. However, it helps to have a digestion that can assimilate, eliminate, uh, uh, sorry, that can digest, assimilate, and eliminate without immune burden. And these issues, the without immune burden, without damaging and oxidizing the fats, with facilitated transport so that it gets where you want it to go, so that you're actually taking an active form and uncontaminated, because are you aware that fish swim in the ocean? Have you looked at the ocean lately? Oh, what a mess. So you have to have distilled fish oils, distilled under nitrogen, to protect from oxidative damage and to remove the mercury and the 45 other schmutzy things that are in there. So you want distilled fish oils distilled under nitrogen, my recommendation is over 1,000 milligrams per soft gel. And then how much do you take? Well, in general, two to six grams is what's recommended. But I have a lot of people who need seven to nine. And, and when I take nine grams a day, my blood pressure is better, my vascular compliance is better, my restorative sleep is better. When I take only six, my blood pressure goes up a bit. So the good news is that we can find out what people need. But the other news is they have to put some effort in, and I don't know what dose everybody needs. And I know that makes things a little complicated, but I think it's worth it because now you're working at the physiologic, really personalized level, and I think a lot of people want that kind of personalized attention. Yeah, when we talk about peroxidation, that's oxidation, but specifically making peroxides. And you want peroxides inside the lysosome recycling center of the cell, but you don't want peroxides anywhere else because it'll kill you. And so, uh, yes, to peroxides locally in the lysosome, but if they're anywhere else, that's a sign of antioxidant deficit and a need for a C cleanse. Oh, no, let me, let me, no, but let me explain the situation. Before we had nitrogen distilled high quality fish oils, people were taking fish oils that were contaminated. Don't do that. And so, wait, let me, may I finish? May I, may I finish? So when you go back and do a retrospective analysis, you look for self-reported or otherwise reported fish oil intake, but it doesn't tell you whether it was a contaminated, oxidized, damaged form of fish oil, or it was a distilled under nitrogen, properly protected form of fish oil. And this is a big problem with a lot of these retrospective analyses, 
whether they be meta-analyses or retrospective analyses. They don't distinguish the quality. They only tell you the item, like, did they take fish oil? And I promise you that contaminated fish oil will harm you, and I promise you that uncontaminated fish oil will heal you. However, those studies have no ability to distinguish because they don't know the brand, they don't know the form, they don't know whether it was the distilled under nitrogen, you know, better form, or whether it's the form that I would, ever, would never give to a person, which is fish oils that haven't been distilled under nitrogen. And we could go through a lot of examples like that, and they exist. The literature says, beware, 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 because. And what it comes down to is the contaminated form of the nutrient should never be used. And most of the studies are based on the contaminated form of the nutrients. Are you aware that high dose of vitamin E is now, there's caution about high dose vitamin E, but do you know that that study ignored the studies of the Shoot brothers? So there were studies in Canada over three decades showing that very high doses of wheat germ oil and natural vitamin E in the eight forms protected and prevented cardiovascular disease and atherosclerosis. Fast forward to a few years ago. They gave 400 and 800 IU of the most common vitamin E, which is D-alpha-tocopherol succinate, one of eight forms. And I can predict if you give one of eight forms, the other seven will become progressively imbalanced. And the conclusion, and it was a self-fulfilling prophecy, you can take 400 IU the way most supplements have them, but don't take 800. And the headlines were categorical. Low dose vitamin E safe, high dose vitamin E not. And so I read the article. They didn't cite this historical, very important literature that shows that natural vitamin E helps, doesn't harm. And they ignored the fact that they were using the most common supplement form, but it was one out of eight. And by the way, D-alpha tocopherol, D-alpha vitamin E, doesn't help the heart. Gamma tocopherol helps the heart. So the more D-alpha you give, the more you dilute the gamma and therefore harm the heart. But if you take mixed natural tocopherols up to 3,600 IU a day and selenomethionine, because you must have selenomethionine along with your tocopherols, otherwise they don't work. Now you have cardioprotective physiologic benefit. And there are just dozens of examples like this where someone does a big study and does a big retrospective analysis and they say, be cautious, be cautious, be cautious, you know, wait until more data is in. And I say, you're, you're mining confusion, and what comes out of that is more confusion. And I think what I was wondering about, though, uh -huh. was, uh, because I, I, mean, I, I actually used to speak on topics, mm -hmm. and so I'm aware of the quality of the fish oil. What I became concerned about is, once the person takes it, it gives a high quality. Am I risking them going to Well, if you, want to, if you want to avoid peroxidation that damages, then have a scorbate cleanse to set the redox and prevent excessive peroxidation. Right, so that's one of the real benefits of the C-cleanse. So this happens to be my omega-3 index, 16.4%. Desirable is over 8%. Question? How about uh, bleeding risk? Yes, right. How about bleeding risk? This guy, the one who had 16.4%, has a familial low factor 8. Me. Familial low factor 8. Not hemophiliac, but low factor 8, which should predispose you to bleeding. And how did I find this out? I was a student in a coagulation lab, and they were standardizing the bleeding time test, and so they tested me without aspirin, and my clotting was fine. And then they gave me an aspirin or two, and came back a few hours later, and it took an hour and a half for me to stop bleeding, which is way long. And then Franny, the technician, comes to me and says, how you feeling? And I said, well, until you asked, I was feeling fine. And then she said, Dan, the boss, wants to talk to you. And I'm a student at this point, and I am sure on my way to his office that I'm dying of something because he doesn't normally talk to me. So I walk in, and I say, he says, how you feeling? <laughs> I said, uh, Franny asked me the same thing, Dan, why am I here? He says, don't take aspirin. I said, I figured that out. He says, okay, dismissed. Now, in my family, a low factor eight should predispose you to a bleeding 
diathesis if it existed. And what I'm telling you is, on my super high omega-3 intake, my bleeding time has stayed the same. So there are many canards and myths. If you take in damaged fish oil, oxidized fish oil, the way it's available commercially, that probably does create problems, but not this, uh, clotting problems. But it's the oxidized damaged fat, it's not the beneficial EPA DHA. But just look at up to date or look at any of the good quality professional databases and out of an excess of caution, every caveat, every concern is listed. Like be careful about fish oils, they'll induce a, a, a clotting disorder or excessive bleeding. The opposite turns out to be the case. You repair small blood vessels when you have enough omega-3. And magnesium, when you have enough, is the antioxidant that protects the essential fats. So when you put the whole team together, now you have a synergy of benefits and a synergy of safety. It's when you use them alone and in isolation that you can potentially get into trouble. Uh, not only, do I, not only do I recommend continuing it before and after surgery, I have some, a few, surgical colleagues who completely agree that the patient has less pain and quicker recovery when they're not omega-3 deficient, when they're, when they're not ascorbate deficient, when they're not magnesium deficient. But most surgeons will tell you for a certain period of time before and after surgery, take none a day. Take none a day. And why? Because they learn take none a day. It's such an easy phrase and everyone can say it. Well, they're concerned about concerns, but they're not concerned about facts. <laughs> uh, how do we as practitioners or the consumer know what fish oil is okay? Oh, oh, in these cases, the few companies that actually go to the trouble of buying the distilled under nitrogen fish oils will very, very prominently tell you so, because they want you to know how much effort and money they're spending on it. So in these cases, the better quality is clearly communicated by the few who, who follow it. And we, of course, take the position that you can only use what's been shown beneficial in clinical studies. That's one of the restrictions in PERC. Everything in our products has to be active. That's one of the restrictions on PERC, and I think that's why people get better results using these approaches. I you think it was that they were not, they oxidized too easily and they had mercury toxicity, what were the... Well, the, the, yeah, the main, the main problems with fish oils have long been contamination with toxic metals plus the oxidation problem, but then there are many other problems because the ocean is full of other toxins that get into the fish's liver and you're just squeezing the liver to get the oils out. So we really have a lot of reasons why we want to do the distilled under nitrogen form and then mycelize it in a soft gel so that you can have a decent shelf life. So is it possible to get enough of the omega-3s without fish oil if you're using a supplement form? Like well, you mean, you mean an algae form? So an algae would be DHA, and here's the problem. DHA doesn't interconvert with EPA. And so there are companies that make algae-based omega-3, and they will tell you that all you need is DHA. And I'm telling you, leave the krill in Antarctica. So you can only get it by fish oil with the EPA, is what you're saying? Well, I don't know any other. Well, uh, no, I will tell you that if you, if you catch, uh, if you line catch deep water oily fish and eat probably a portion a day, you may, may not need supplements, depending on how fast you're using them up. But, but I mean supplements, if you're supplementing omega-3 to balance omega-6, is there other ways that you can get it besides fish oil is what I'm asking? No, no, you keep asking the question and I keep saying no. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so there, are, there are algae forms, but they're only DHA. And remember I said you need both. And if you give just DHA, you will imbalance the EPA for the reason we talked about before. When you give one thing to excess in the hope that it's somehow going to magically do things, we end up finding that magic doesn't work so well. Yeah, krill is algae, is DHA only. It's exactly what I'm saying not to do. No, krill, krill are tiny organisms that are mostly in very cold water and whales and other 
sea creatures eat them. Uh, but there are a number of algae that are used commercially today to make DHA. They add DHA to infant formula. OK, but I would rather have them add EPA and DHA. If you're vegan, if you're vegan, then I have to have a conversation with you. No, 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 this is a fair question. If you're vegan, I have to have a conversation with you. Are you willing to take something medicinal so that your body can recover so that you can then choose whether to take in something like fish oil? And I point out that after you distill the fish oil under nitrogen, it's no longer fish oil. It's now medicine. Look, look, I understand. And if you are a philosophical vegan, if you are a philosophical, ethical vegan, I wish you well. And I want you to report over the years how healthy those people are because they're living in a world that we're not living in. And I'm not trying to be hypercritical here, but I have met so many unwell vegans who are trying to save the planet at the cost of their own health. So I'm in favor of eating low on the food chain, as they are. I'm in favor of eating foods you can digest, assimilate, and eliminate without immune burden, as I hope they are. But I hear too many people who say to me, my political or ethical or value system is such that I may do this and I may not do that, and I'm now going to tell you my experience. So I decided at one point that being a vegetarian was a better choice. And for six months, I got healthier. For six months, I plateaued. And then for six months, I got sick. And while I was not doing well, I went to every expert I could, a number of them. Every one of them had the answer. None of them had the same recommendation, which is a hint that nobody knows the answer. And I finally went to Bhante, the Cambodian monk, who at that point was vegetarian. And he looked at me and he said, why do you think at this point in your life you can be a vegetarian or a vegan? He says, with the travel you do, with the stresses you deal with, with the way in which your life and style are organized, why do you think it's the better choice? Now, as I said, if you're vegetarian or vegan because it's the better choice, I'm your friend. But if you say, I will deny myself something that can save my life, EPA and DHA, because it originally came from a fish and you had to sacrifice the fish, I'll talk to you about being a Jain. You know the Jains? These are people who wear a mask over their mouth because they don't want a bug to fly in and cause, OK? Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to be um, cute here. I'm saying that you can take any good idea and push it beyond where it helps the individual. And I want people to make informed choices. And I believe that I can convince most people that there's a change in state when you purify some of these things. For example, this is the season of Passover liberation and so forth. Honey is kosher and encouraged Raw honey is encouraged as a medicinal food, but it comes from bees. And bees are not kosher. So there are many times where you can show someone a nuance that helps them say, while I'm getting better, I'm going to concentrate on getting better. And as soon as I'm well enough, then I'm going to eat as low on the food chain as I can and in harmony with my nature. Fair enough? OK. Um, what do you think of the blood spot test and what laboratories do you recommend for it? Right. Um, you can work through our lab for most of these. There are also direct access and high interpretation places like Better Lab Test Now that we support. So there are a whole range of options now that, from our point of view, make this stuff accessible. Because if you don't use the goal values, you get confused, and you want the higher precision testing as possible. So with regard to the omega-3 index, we want it to be more than 8%. You can get this directly from Bill Harris's lab, or you can get it through uh, our resources. 
Um, and I, I, I cannot overstate, uh, uh, I would like to state strongly, uh, how valuable we find this to be. Um, and we've had experience with people who have asked almost every kind of question. So if your clients have a question, call us up. Chances are we've heard the question. How often do you retest? Yes, you retest about every six months, about every six months, and in some cases every three months. So if you're really trying to make rapid uh, improvements every three months, um, and for most people, six months. Uh, in terms of labs, you want the labs that provide both quality and goal value interpretations. Goal value interpretations. Okay. Oh, I wrote a long time ago about testing. Uh -huh. One question I get every nutrition talk is type diet. Right. And can ABs be more vegetarian than O's? Right. Well, Peter Diadamo, picking up on his dad's work, has long been improving and refining blood types. But now, if I understand Peter, uh, you must have all of the different lectins and all of the different subgroups, and now it becomes a much more complicated, somewhat more expensive process. But he seems to now agree that if you only have the blood type, you're kind of throwing darts. So, so for the, the lectin idea, so would you say that if you have healthy tracks, Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. If you follow the LRA by ELISA Act plan, then you find lectins are your friend. But if you're not doing some immune tolerance and restoration program, then lectins can cause an already overactive immune system to be uh, overstimulated. And that was what Peter was concerned about. But it turns out in beans and in many legumes are these lectins. And they're necessary to stimulate immune response at certain times, but you want the immune system to be tolerant at those times, not reactive. And so what happens is people notice the immune system's reactive, but we don't really know how to get at it because they didn't have lymphocyte response assay available. And then they say, take none a day. When in doubt, don't. But that isn't what I say. What I say is, Use these kinds of tests with their goal values so now you know what the individual needs so that the background context is health promoting. And when the context, when the cells are in balance and resilient, they'll do things for you that will pleasantly surprise you. And when you don't have that background context, because often colleagues come to me and they want to talk about the most esoteric subjects which I love to talk about, however, they've forgotten about the first floor or the foundation upon which everything else is built. And in a sense, this is the foundation. And uh, I don't believe that there's going to be any predictive biomarker test that will need to be added to this list or taken away from this list. And we do now know the goal values. So as they say, go forth and prosper. Go forth and use this information uh, and make it yours. Mm -hmm.